You're listening to Pop Culture Detective Audio Files. In each episode, we investigate the social and political messages embedded in popular media. I'm your host, Jonathan McIntosh, and on today's episode, we're going to do something a little different and go behind the scenes to talk about some of the legal issues that can arise when you're doing media reviews or cultural criticism. Specifically, we're going to discuss copyright and the exceptions to it under what's called the Fair Use Doctrine. We're also going to dig into how fair use interacts, or doesn't, with YouTube's content ID system. To that end, we're joined by two guests who are both experts in this field. Art Neal is the executive director and founder of the organization New Media Rights. And Erica Lee is the assistant director. New Media Rights is a clinical program of California Western School of Law that provides legal services to creators, entrepreneurs, journalists, and internet users whose projects require specialized internet, intellectual property, privacy, or media law expertise. Thank you both for joining us today. Hi. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having us. As many of listeners will no doubt be aware, uh, I've been creating these long form video essays on the Pop Culture Detective YouTube channel for a number of years now. And those videos are constructed mainly using footage borrowed from popular movies and TV shows and video games. And sometimes I'll borrow footage from 50 or even 100 different sources and then edit them together to make that media critique. Now, it might be obvious to most people, but I don't try to go and get permission before I do that. You know, I'm not going to to Disney and to say, hey, I'm going to make this harsh critique of your Marvel movies uh, and the messages therein. Can I have permission to do that? And I don't do that for a bunch of reasons. One, they probably wouldn't give it to me because I'm being critical of their, you know, multi-billion dollar franchise. And even if they did, it would be impossible to license. It would be more money than I'll ever have in my life. And I don't think I should have to. I think I should be able to criticize the powerful corporations, politicians, et cetera, without getting their permission to do so. Yeah. And the exception to copyright law that allows me to do that is something called the Fair Use Doctrine. At least it's called that in the United States. And it's also relevant to people who work in media criticism, which is what I do, uh, but also to journalists, to people who produce the news, artists, someone who does movie reviews or, or game reviews or, or whatever. And so I thought we could start this discussion by asking our two experts here to give us sort of a quick overview of fair use and how it works. Right. So I don't think many people think that you should have to ask permission from those entities when you're directly criticizing their work, right? And so fair use is that, it is that release of uh, from copyright, and it really is the First Amendment safety valve right. that allows us to speak to one another. It's that important. I wanted to also say that you're right, Jonathan, that there are so many folks who create and, and share things online for which you know fair use is relevant. I also think that that universe of people includes everybody listening to this because to the extent that you post on social media ever, to the extent that you post anything online that wasn't yours, like if you go on Facebook or Twitter and you post a quote from somebody else, that's more than a sentence. Our dialogue online relies on fair use. Our ability to literally speak to one another about everything, culture, politics, et cetera, which became even more acute during the pandemic, relies on fair use. Fair use is a, it is for all these creators to rely on, but it's actually for all of us. It's there every day, even in something as silly as like a meme that you see. Uh, you know, it's not it's not likely the person that posted that was the original creator of that photo from, you know, Game of Thrones or whatever it is. And so in that sense, we see it and we live in a world where there's fair use, you know, every day. It's almost part of our digital language, right? Because you think of um, of a GIF, right? Usually GIFs are taken from a, a movie, a TV show, whatever it is. It's a very small, you know, two or three second loop of that thing. Um, but people will respond. You know, I I've, I do this. You know, someone says something on Twitter or whatever, and I just respond with a GIF. It becomes part of our our larger sort of cultural discourse. Absolutely, it enriches the way that we're able to to speak to one another. And again, the reason that I can do that is it has to do with fair use. 
Right. So copyright protection lasts a long time. It lasts for life plus 70 years of the creator, right? And it covers a lot of different things. The films that we see, the books that we read, uh, the videos that we watch online, the podcasts that we listen to online. When you or any other creator wants to reuse the work of a third party, I think a good rule of thumb for people to think about is that there are only three options for you. Number one, you can do what you were talking about, which is that you could get permission, right? You could get permission from the original creator. Uh, Number two, the work could be in the public domain. So as long as it's, uh, you know, from quite some time ago, what is, are we up to 28? Yep, we're up to 1928. So anything published (laughs) prior to 1928 is technically freely available to use right? without permission. Right, And recently that includes Winnie the Pooh. So I know there's a bunch yes. of remixes or re, uh, reboots of Winnie the Pooh that are a little different maybe <laughs> than the original. Right, exactly. So public domain's an option. Getting permission is an option. The only other option you really have, if the work is not your own original material, is to utilize fair use. And it really is this set of four factors. There's this preliminary kind of preamble to fair use, which says, well, if it's commentary, if it's educational, if it's criticism, if it's research, uh, then maybe it's more likely to be fair use. But really, you look at the four factors of fair use. And I can take the first two, you take the second two, maybe, Erica, just a quick overview for folks. Sure. That first factor, first question is, Are you reusing the work commercially or not? That is, are you making money off the work? And that could be directly, you're just selling the work, but maybe you're doing something a little more indirect, like selling access to the work, or maybe you're using the work in a way that's kind of promotional and commercial. And so commercial use is less likely to be fair use. Non-commercial educational uses may be more likely to be fair use. The second part of that first factor, though, is probably the leading driver of fair use decisions, and that is whether a work is transformative or not. The famous case was in the 90s. It was Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman that was parodied by Two Live Crew, and you know that's called Campbell versus A. Cuff Rose. And essentially, the point was, did you add a new purpose, meaning, or message to the work? That was the question. And so you really need to have transformed the underlying work. And when you're trying to figure out if you transformed something, what you do is you first look at the original and say, what was the original all about? Then you look at the new work and you say, well, how is that work's message or purpose different from the original, right? And I want to say here that fair use is not just about music parodies. It's It covers many different types of usage. It covers a lot of really important political, cultural criticism that we see online. And in addition, it covers things and technologies that we use every day, like the internet search that you do. You see little snippets uh, from a website, image search that we're, we're all used to going to say, do an image search. Well, image search and thumbnails, that's also protected by fair use. Uh, that's the first factor. Is it transformative or not? If you don't have transformation, you probably don't have fair use. So it's something to really think about. The second factor, uh, two parts to that. First part is just, is it a highly creative work? That is, is it fictional literature or music? If so, it's going to be protected more. Mm. On the other side, if it's really fact heavy, then, you know, it's less likely to be protected and, and, you know, more likely to be fair use. And then on the second part of that factor, really important actually is, If you are publishing something that is not yet published, right? You've got a friend who works for some studio and they're feeding you, you know, the early edition of some new uh, blockbuster movie. Right. Courts are going to be less friendly to the use of that material. So that's the first two factors. And and there's a whole ecosystem around around, uh, studio leaks and and people republishing those to get views. And this is a, a very popular trend. Right. These days. If you're publishing a leak, it's a lot more difficult argument to get fair use. The second factor a lot of people uh, will ignore or and and it often is not sort of critical, although it does come into play when there's music involved, because frankly, courts just treat music 
differently and they protect music more. We're used to seeing quotations of text, but you're really not allowed to quote music without permission a whole lot. And then, yeah, if it's if it's unpublished, courts are going to really protect that. Um, so just real quick before we jump into the other two, because I think this is something that people are very confused about often, is the idea that like if I'm not making money off of it, then it's fine. And conversely, I'm monetizing this, and so therefore it isn't fair use. But not, neither of those things are actually totally true, right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, there's no particular, you know, just because something is non-commercial and you're not necessarily putting ads on it on YouTube, that does not make it, you know, make it somehow fair use. You can think maybe to draw that example out a little bit, you could think about folks, you know, who maybe go to a site where you could stream movies illegally or something like that and upload a movie, okay? Or maybe file sharing a movie or something. You might not be making money off that, but it still could be a copyright issue. And then also this goes way back into the broadcast days. And I've, I've talked to people from a number of generations that have these myths, but there is no percent rule either. There's no, or seconds, mm. there's not 10% or less right. is not an actual thing. Uh, 10 seconds or less, not an actual thing, which is actually a great segue to talk about amount and substantiality. Yeah, what a great segue. <laughs> so factor three, right? <laughs> <Welcome>. <laughs> factor three is all about the amount that you've taken from that original work. So you can think about this third factor in both like a quantitative sense, but also a qualitative sense too. So from a quantity perspective, how much did you take in comparison to that original work right? Like, was it 20 seconds from a two hour long movie? Maybe that's more likely to be fair use because that's a very small portion, right? Comparatively. Um, Or was it three minutes of a five minute YouTube video? That's starting to kind of verge on the line of probably less likely to be fair use because that's a lot to take from that original five minutes. And then for quality, right? How, How important was the part that you took to that original work. Um, And you'll often hear this referred to as, you know, did you take the heart of the work? Did you take the most important or most memorable part of that original content? I I tend to think of this too as the, the spoiler alert part of the analysis, right? Like, hopefully everybody has seen the movie Frozen, Uh right? So if you're taking like the critical scene near the end of the movie, right, where she freezes her sister's heart, that is one of the most memorable moments. And so you better make sure that you have something really transformative or really really critical, right, um, to say about that moment if you're going to use the heart of the work. So it's both that quantity and, and qualitative analysis that that has to happen there. But as Art was saying before, right, there used to be this best practice guideline of 10 seconds uh, or less is, is automatically going to be fair use. Um, but that's not necessarily true, right? It's taken on balance in terms of that, that original work, right? That's the amount use factor. And then factor four is all about the market effect, what does your use do to the market for that original content? So the, the critical question here is, is your new work acting as a direct substitute for that original content? And if the answer there is yes, then it's less likely to be a fair use. So if somebody could, could come to your YouTube video, for example, and they could simply watch let's say like a a music video in its entirety without having to go to that, to that musician's channel or buy the song, then you're probably acting as a direct substitute there. That's kind of a, a very big, broad sweeping example there, but it illustrates that point of, you know, that's the type of use that the law is trying to kind of prevent there. That would have a negative impact on the market for that original content. So those are the four factors. And I think it's also important to remember that all four of the factors are taken on balance, right? So kind of circling back to what you were just talking about before about sometimes commercial uses can be found as fair uses, right? It depends on how transformative was your commercial use. Um, did you use, how much did you use 
from that original. And maybe you used just a tiny little bit and it had barely any effect on the market and that outweighed the commercialization of your content. Um, so they all are, are taken on balance with each other. And there really isn't one that's super determinative of the analysis. There's not necessarily going to want going to be one thing that that carries the day. Right. Right. And I was going to just throw in there that it's it's certainly direct market and direct substitution. And courts will also look at uh, realistic secondary markets. So you think about something like music and you say, well, you know, main, main market for music is listening to it, uh, you know, on Spotify or watch the music video on YouTube. But also there's, of course, a licensing market for videos and things like that. Because this is all sort of behind the scenes. It, when I tell people that I make video essays, they want to know how do you write the scripts and, you know, uh, how do you edit the footage and what programs do you use and whatever. Uh, but I'm also always thinking about these sort of fair use questions because I know that's going to be part of it, right? Like once I finish something, I publish it, and it's on YouTube, it's doing great. And then suddenly I will get that, like the algorithm has decided. And we're going to talk about uh, content ID and dig into sort of the YouTube system in a second. But I just wanted to bring up a couple things that I hear a lot when I tell people about fair use. Right. And one of those things is what constitutes as commentary? Because some people will say, hey, I loved this movie, and I want to make a video essay explaining why it's so amazing. Uh, they're analyzing it, but they're afraid that that maybe isn't fair use because they're not being critical. They're not ripping it to shreds. And so, yeah, that question of what constitutes commentary, does it have to be extremely negative to count? No, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be negative. But I think you hit on the critical differentiation there, which is like the why factor. You're explaining like why this particular film or moment in this scene resonated with you, right? It's like being able to explain the why behind that, I think is kind of the critical component of trying to make something a, a commentary. But it's tricky, right? Because laudatory uses, right? Just praising something because you like it or it sounds great or it looks awesome. Those are generally not going to be fair use or they're going to be less likely to be fair use because it's not very transformative, right? Thinking about that, that sub factor of, of factor one, is it transformative if you're saying this sounds awesome? It's less likely to to be transformative in that sense. And so I think it's, you know, it, it seems to be a little bit easier to make those those critical uses, right, to kind of put those in the box of transformativeness. Um, but there are ways to make those those commentaries. I was just trying to think of an example, perhaps. I was, but. <laughs> I was thinking about, when you were talking about that, Erica, I was thinking about an example that I saw sort of over the last year, I've seen a number of folks who, these are not clients or anything. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just observing this as somebody who enjoys watching these, these videos, but um, you know, I enjoy singing and playing music. And so I found these, some videos where somebody who's really um, experienced singer will sort of dissect a, a famous singer's, you know, unique uh, qualities, right? Because all these, every singer has sort of their own unique approach and, and voice. And it's really neat to kind of see, though, somebody who's an expert, and they certainly are being laudatory. Uh, and they're not playing the full song, they'll, they'll play just a, a very quick portion, and, and then spend many minutes sort of going through playing on the piano and kind of showing you the different ways you could approach how to sing this and maybe actually how how sort of difficult it is to pull off what the singer is doing. And I think that's an example, not in, of course, that's, you can't mm -hmm. say across the board, each one you have to look at differently. <laughs> right. But like Erica said, you just, you need, there's more to do if you're going to be <laughs> laudatory. So, so it needs to be sort of more analytic in the way that it's describing either the filmmaking techniques or the, or the music making techniques or whatever, like the more analyzing of it that you do, the, the better. Yeah, what are you adding? What are you layering on? And how are you in the delivery of it, avoiding just like being a substitute? Another question that comes up, which is related, what counts as transformation? So that, you know, we have, let's just take a movie, since I often will comment on movies and, and use clips. There's a movie, you know, what is the purpose of that work is to entertain people to tell a story. And then when I'm taking a snippet of that, or when someone, a, a movie critic is taking a snippet of it to give their review, they're transforming it from entertainment into criticism. 
Like, is that what is that what transformation means? I would go right to to what Erica was talking about. We work with many documentary filmmakers, and a lot of the difficult conversations that I find myself having are really moments where us as attorneys couldn't really discern mm. the other layer. We we don't under we couldn't discern the message. We couldn't discern how, you know, what that new creativity was and what the what sort of the purpose of that use was. And I think that's that's really important. To make it clear why you're using this clip or this segment and and how that works with or supports whatever uh, commentary you're making. And, and and to try to make that as clear as possible. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like if somebody asked you, um, you know, it'd be good to be able to explain why were you using that clip and have that explanation not just be aesthetic. Right, right. Not just that you liked the way it looked or the way that it sounded, that you were uh, trying to make a specific commentary. Ideally, that you were actually commenting or um, critic- criticizing the underlying work. So one more thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of the, the last two factors there. There's sort of this myth that, well, if you're making criticism of a movie or a game or something, and your criticism is so good that it gets people to not go watch that movie or not buy the DVD, then that would hurt the market and therefore you're not allowed to do it. Now, I get that usually from people who don't like what I'm saying <laughs> about their favorite thing. Uh, but that's not true either, right? No, that's not true at all. There's actually there's actually case law that actually says that you know if the criticism actually causes people to rethink their interest in the work or the series or whatever it is, that is not that is not an actual sort of uh, you know market harm, right? It's more about whether it substitutes, not whether the criticism causes people to to rethink their interest in the work. I should say that one of the the ways that you are all able to, see, you know, all the people listening to this are able to hear and see my work on YouTube is in, in part thanks to New Media Rights because you all have helped me on a number of occasions get my videos back online when they have been unjustly uh, removed. So I thought we might transition into talking about YouTube's content ID system and, and content ID systems in general. You know, when most people are interacting with these sort of ideas of fair use, they're doing it through a platform uh, like YouTube, like TikTok, like Facebook or Instagram. And so, you know, just as an example, I work on a video essay for three or four months and it's finally ready to go uh, and I hit upload. I'll immediately go over to a Word document and start writing out my fair use defense because I'm anticipating that at some point along the line, I'm going to get content ID'd. You know, YouTube system is either going to say, hey, we've automatically flagged this as a violation, or more likely, it'll say, oh, this has been this has been flagged by a third party. And they have they have identified this manually. And then I, I will go through the process of navigating YouTube's system uh, to try to dispute that copyright claim. It is opaque. Uh, in a lot of ways and scary because every step of the way YouTube says, hey, do you really want to dispute this? Because you might just lose your channel. And so I thought we could maybe talk about that because when I'm engaging with YouTube's system there, that's not a legal thing, right? That's sort of an extra legal thing. And how is that different from engaging in in a legal dispute? You've identified that, you know, things like content ID, which is what YouTube uses, it's their program, their algorithm that they use. It's designed to help copyright holders control their creative content on YouTube. How it works is that the copyright owner can either manually or just automatically block any videos that are uploaded that they believe are infringing. Um, They can mute the video, right? Mm -hmm. Um, They could block certain platforms or devices or websites from allowing the video to to play. And a content ID claim is a preliminary informal step that they can use before they even consider taking that next step of sending a formal DMCA takedown notice and having YouTube take it down under the DMCA, right? It's like, it's this preliminary layer that's more informal than the than the DMCA takedown process, which is interesting because the DMCA takedown process is already kind of 
an informal out of court way for copyright owners to to take down allegedly infringing uses of their content. So yeah, I think the, the key difference between content things like content ID, right, and the DMCA is again, the DMCA is a law, right? It requires, it demands, it requires, it obligates service providers like YouTube to take down that content when they receive a notice from the copyright holder. And it can it can eventually, if you go through the stages, right, can lead to a lawsuit. Whereas content ID claims are that informal way to try to resolve this infringement claim or concern before they can resort to using that more serious step of the law, the DMCA, to try to remove the content. And the, and the DMCA, just for listeners, is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Yes. And this is the piece of legislation that, that allows for YouTube to exist in the first place. In a nutshell, right? Because the DMCA, one of the things that it does is it gives service providers like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, these safe harbor protections, right? As long as they follow the mm-hmm. steps laid out in the law um, and do everything they're supposed to, they're kind of taken out of the picture uh, when it comes to infringement, they're not going to be held liable for that mm-hmm. copyright infringement or held responsible for the copyright infringement of their users, mm-hmm. right? So it's, yeah, so it does allow these services like YouTube to exist and and function on a very basic level. Because without it, they'd be getting infringement claims left and right, <laughs> and they'd have to deal with those claims and probably would have to shut down very quickly um, because of being tied up in court all the time. And I think most of these disputes that we see, they probably end at the content ID stage, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this whole back library where big music studios and big movie studios, they upload everything into this library and it checks every time you upload a video, checks your video against just millions of different pieces of content and then flags it. And, and the other important thing that media companies can do at that stage is that they can claim your video right. and they right. can claim, therefore, your revenue. And so this content ID is really a business decision because if the if the company leans on the DMCA, right, and says, well, we're just going to do normal DMCA, you still need quite a few people if you're Google and you run <laughs> Google image search and YouTube and, and Google search engine, like you're going to get millions of requests for takedowns every month. And they do. But if you invent content, if you come up with the content ID system, well, what happens is then the video can stay up instead of going down and Google can continue to get ad revenue. The underlying company can get the ad revenue. And so I think sometimes when people see a video online, especially after maybe after listening to this podcast, they might say, well, wait a second, how are these people using this in their video? Right. Well, the answer might be that that they're not getting any of the ad revenue. Right. I mean, this is something that I've run into with my videos quite a bit is that, you know, in the beginning, you know, when, when, when YouTube was sort of trying to figure all this out, often when there would be a copyright claim, it would mean the video is either blocked in certain countries or just taken down. That used to be the thing that would happen. You know, I'm very careful, as careful as I can be in, in producing something. I spend a lot of time in the editing process, just shortening clips and lowering audio and so on. Uh, I think that I have a good grasp of fair use and what it is. And so when I upload something, I'm pretty confident it could be argued to be fair use. Uh, and so before it would just go down, you know, you used to get that little sad face, little frowny YouTube face on there uh, instead of the video. And so I still get some blocked in certain countries, but almost hundred percent now it says instead, this video has been claimed by Warner brothers or, or whatever. And all of the revenue from this video is now going to that company. And so it might be that I have a, a half an hour long video and I'm using a 10 second clip from Harry Potter or something. And now my entire video is being monetized by, you know, by Warner Brothers and they're, they're, they're taking the ad revenue. I, I assume splitting it with YouTube. Uh, that puts me as a creator in an awkward position. You know, a, a lot of people on YouTube who do cultural criticism, who do uh, media reviews, they get most of their money from ad revenue. Now, I, I personally don't do that. I have a different model. But when you get money from ad revenues, the first couple days 
are the most important because that's when you're going to get the majority of your views, you know, and then you can sort of get diminishing returns. When they flag your video, you're suddenly not getting that revenue. Your video is up and your audience is still watching it, but you're getting nothing. I mean, that can be very discouraging for someone who spent, you know, weeks or months making something. I have a slightly different model. Mine is that I have no ads on my videos. And that's sort of the the benefit that I give to people who crowdfund my work. I say, you know, uh, give me a couple bucks a month, whatever. Uh, and the, in return, you can just watch my videos with no ads. Well, that creates kind of a problem if suddenly my videos have ads. And so the process of trying to dispute that, which YouTube does provide, you can go and you can hit dispute and you can, and there's actually two layers to this process, right? The first one is a, is a quick, Hey, I think this is wrong. And the second one is, Hey, really, this is wrong. And here's my fair use argument. And if you really disagree with this, you need to take the video down via DMCA. That's the second step. They have 30 days to respond. And so the ads will stay up. They could respond right away. That would be great. Uh, they often will just let it drag out uh, for the entire 30 days. Um, now, they're supposed to hold the, the revenue in escrow and maybe give it to you if you win or if or whatever, but it does create such a, a hurdle that a lot of media creators just can't afford to go through that process all the time. And I think not only can they they not afford it, I think that when you talk about a situation where the video is left up online, right? So it's monetized, but the video at least still exists. We see a lot of creators who are intimidated when the when the claimant on the other end is Warner Music, Sony Music, right. Universal Music, one of the big movie studios. And, and folks need to know that they have a way to dispute and they have the right to dispute when they have a fair use argument. But I think what happens there is some folks really don't want to go down that road mm. and say, oh my gosh, well, Sony Music is going against me. I mean, I don't I'd just rather get back to doing what I do. I don't I don't need need this headache. And and, and let, also it's just, yeah, it is so ironic to have these sort of the, this critical media particularly monetized. Yeah, in my case, it's like, you know, I'm I'm being critical of a certain franchise from a certain company. And then they're like, oh, yeah, that can stay up. Uh -huh. But we want to make the money off of you <laughs> criticizing us. And it's like, right. that doesn't seem right. Sure. Yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't seem right. And, and it's, there's so many ways in which just the process and the way things appear to the user sort of discourage, I think, appeals. And also, if we're talking about the DMCA process, what are called counter notices, which are you know similar to appeals in the content ID system, where they really make you actually write out your answer to the factors of fair use. And those factors we mentioned earlier, if you never see those again, you might see them on a YouTube appeal form. And I think yep. those themselves can be a bit intimidating. I mean, even mm -hmm. our law students who have been in law school for a few years are a little bit like, okay, wait a second, four factors. And and so um, there are really some, some barriers. And also, if you're talking about the DMCA, there are huge consequences to counter noticing, right? Because a, a, an appeal that is a formal counter notice under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, two things. Number one, you're agreeing to jurisdiction in federal court, right? And so it's it's a huge thing to say like, you know, you're you're actually agreeing to jurisdiction and you're basically agreeing to go to court over the matter. If and and so that and, is, and this is just to be clear, this is what happens if you go through YouTube's content ID sort of dispute process and you kind of get to the end of it. Right. And then you still want to You keep appealing that content ID. And then what they tell the claimant from YouTube side is, look, claimant, you either need to let it go or you can actually file a formal DMCA takedown notice. And if that claimant, if the claimant does that, then your last, your right, and it's a statutory right under law is to file a counter notice. Now, the other thing that goes into that counter notice, which is required, is your name and mm -hmm. your address. And right. that is also a huge barrier, right? Right, especially if you're being critical of something political, powerful interest. Yes, yeah. It can be, you know, you can say, "Well, wait a second. You're saying that my name and address have to go to the people that I'm criticizing harshly, and like that's that's can be very scary." Now, I should say that uh, every video that I have disputed has eventually wound up back on YouTube. 
with the help of new media rights, usually, uh, I have won eventually all of those disputes and my, all of my work, everything I've made is is available to watch. Right. Now, maybe I'm in a uni- unique position where I kind of like would like to make an example of them if they're doing something blatantly ignoring the fair use doctrine, which tends to happen. I mean, claiming that a video is violating copyright is now a business model unto itself. The incentive on the on the part of not just Warner Brothers or not just a big movie studio, but they often hire a third party to sort of a company to manage all of this stuff for them. Yes. And so that company then goes and just tries to flag as many things as possible, really any instance, uh, regardless of fair use, because they're trying to put ads on as many videos as possible. And so yeah, the video stays up, but their business model now includes essentially uh, taking all of the hard work from small creators or independent media critics, and then essentially stealing their work. It doesn't seem to me, at least, that the fair use defense is considered in that process. So, you know, if, if that happens, I put my little initial like fair use blurb. Hey, no, this is fair use. I'm commenting on this. I'm transforming this. This is criticism. You know, I'm only using a tiny bit, whatever. I send that off. That often gets rejected right away. Like, I don't even think anybody looks at it. And then I have to come to Art and say, Art, they did it again. And then we'll put together an actual argument. And we do that for a lot a lot of folks on a lot of different platforms. And I think that you're right. At the root of a lot of DMCA abuse and, t- and content takedown abuse is actually more you know, p- a business model. People are trying to, you know, oh, I, I want to squeeze just a little more money out of this or that. Uh, property. Let me give you an example. One of the things we've run into, for instance, in the content ID library, there will be some audio or music. And lo and behold, it includes some sort of royalty free loop, right? Mm. And then people are more than willing to say, well, I mean, obviously, this audio which actually has almost nothing discernible from my audio. There must be something that, so I'm going to claim this video because it identified some sort of freely available loop that a hundred other people are, you mm. know, a thousand other people are, are using. And then you have to, like you said, Jonathan, there's so much time and energy that goes into sort of unsticking these things. And they're hoping that you just sort of give up and that maybe you don't have right. the energy to fight them. Uh, we also see the abuse outside of, YouTube. There's so many other platforms. I would mm. say two that you see it on a lot are Etsy oh. and Amazon. People actually really ne- nefarious sort of takedowns that are really intended to just remove a competitor. Mm. You even see that in online platforms, you know, uh, like gaming platforms, like Roblox and things like that. People just don't want competitors. And then they find ways to say, oh, well, you know, that's infringing my work, right? Or they utilize the DMCA as a tool to help them make a little bit more money. And that's the DMCA created. And it's the only law that I know of that's like this, where if you send a letter with the the right six elements, you know, the correct six elements in it to a platform like YouTube or Amazon or Etsy, then they have to remove the work that's allegedly infringing. And for most other things in the law, How do you get somebody to force somebody to do something or to force somebody not to do something? You have to go to a court and get them to actually issue an injunction. But the DMCA, send a letter and it goes down. And so we do see uh, just all over the place, a lot of different platforms uh, where people have to kind of push back and, you know, insist that they have the right to use something that they, they certainly do have the right to use. Is there a consequences or supposed to be consequences for some entity misusing the DMCA to, you know, to try to protect a monopoly or to, yeah. uh, to sort of siphon revenue off of something or to take something down? They're, they're not supposed to do that. There is a section of Section 512, which is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. There's a section that is supposed to provide some damages in the case that somebody basically provides uh, a sort of a specious uh, DMCA notice. But the standard is so high, it has to be knowingly, materially misleading. And in there was a famous case where Prince and Universal Music went after a mom for posting a video of a baby dancing to a Prince song and things like that. Some of the cases that came through there 
in terms of when you can hold the company liable for really what is a, a baseless DMCA notice, uh, the standard is extremely high. Like it, it's, it's, the standard to, to actually have somebody on the hook um, for that is extremely high and the damages aren't, aren't very high either, which is why you only, there's only, you know, probably less than, you know, 10, 15 cases that really, where somebody has really used what I, I believe it's called 512F. So it's, mm-hmm. it's that section of the law, but it's just not that effective and it doesn't have that, that much uh, teeth. Yeah. And, and aside from that too, you brought up the, the lens case, right? I, the, one of the things that came out of that case was in addition to having that very high, knowingly materially misrepresented standard, the other thing that came out of that case was, well, the copyright owner owner just has to subjectively have a reasonable belief that it was infringing. And mm. so, you know, it's subjective. It's easier for the copyright owner to say, well, yeah, we we briefly considered fair use before we sent the takedown and we said, no, it's not fair use. Right. So that's one of the other things that kind of makes it practically difficult to kind of as art was saying it it, the, it doesn't have as much teeth yeah so i mean it seems like we're in a situation where this um this is being abused uh, or I, I would say it's being abused quite a lot for all the reasons that we discussed but or what things can be done and what would you like to see change i mean what what would make this better or more tenable in the in the future i mean there's a couple of things that i can think of immediately that would be helpful i mean a you brought up this idea of the companies that are hired to go out there and identify material and claim it Mm -hmm. on YouTube, Jonathan. And I think that folks need to be more responsible about enforcement. There certainly is infringement online and the DMCA is a tool to take down legitimate infringement. But I do think that when you have people who may not be as well-trained or as well-trained in the law. And they're kind of running around just trying to, with the incentive to maximize Mm. profit, the incentive to claim as much as possible, there should also be some training, training in what does it mean to be fair use? You know, should I consider fair use here? And a little bit more consideration of that before the takedowns are made. I think there needs to be also, um, you know, YouTube does have a pretty well-developed system and despite you know, uh, occasional issues and and some challenges you presented, for the most part, the system seems to to function and things go back up. Some of the other platforms, it's a little bit more difficult even to get movement on. So platforms need to make sure that they understand their obligations to both sides. Like certainly they have the obligation to take things down, but it also needs to be a fully compliant DMCA takedown notice and users have rights too. And there needs to be a functional process for those folks to appeal when their content gets taken down. One other thing to the point of like what needs to happen next is users and and creators knowing and understanding what your rights are, I think is also a big part of it. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily know where to start when these things happen. Mm. That's one of our goals is to make sure we can be a resource for those folks when these things happen, right? It is a pretty niche area. Yeah. New Media Rights has an app that kind of goes through fair use. Do you want to talk about that? Because I I found that very useful. Sure. I mean, I can, I'll talk about the app. So the fair use app, it's available on our website. It's a bit of a, a choose your own adventure style experience, right? Where we walk you through kind of some of the basics of copyright and like how how works our creative expressions are protected and then and then yeah we walk through the the factors of fair use in that kind of question and answer format and hopefully give some some guidance to folks who have questions about fair use and in the end you can always if you have further questions right it's a good time to reach out to an attorney or or to new media rights as well um, so that lives on our website it's it's kind of it's geared a little bit more towards video creators, but it can be really useful even outside of the video creation context. And actually, you can find that at the bottom of all of my videos on YouTube, including this one. If you're watching it on uh, or listening to it on YouTube, yeah, and it's it's really an educational tool, and that's a good segue actually be to like in terms of actual advice, you really want to go to to an attorney and 
that's something I want to make sure people know if they take one thing away about like, what is new media rights? Well, it's your first stop if you have a legal issue online. You know, we have a form that's available and you you go on the form, you can write into us. It could be copyright related. It, it You know, there can be other issues that come up, privacy and other issues we certainly deal with on a regular basis. You are welcome to reach out to us and we will at, at least, you know, sometimes we can take a case. Sometimes we can respond with some some helpful ideas of where to, what to do next. And so what we do on a day-to-day basis, though, uh, Jonathan, is really threefold. First of all, as a, as a global picture, we are a legal clinic. We're a clinic of California Western School of Law. And Erica and I teach this clinic. And so the two of us are attorneys. The rest of the folks that work with us are law students. And then we take on clients and we work with them. Those tend to be folks who are creating things online. It could be early stage technology entrepreneurs. As you said earlier, it could be journalists and just a whole gamut of folks from filmmakers uh, to podcasters, to authors, to software developers and, and beyond. And so what do we do for those folks? We could draft contracts. We could help them with a takedown, you know, that they're dealing with, or, you know, maybe it's the other side. Maybe they're concerned somebody copied their work and they're concerned about like what their rights are. And so, you know, we've worked with folks um, on both sides of that situation. And so they could, you know, get an assessment about that. And a lot of times we're helping people prevent legal issues before they start. That's one of the things that I love about our program is it's sort of problem solving, preventative lawyering. In addition, we also do educational work. I don't know, Eric, if you want to talk about some of the education work we do. Absolutely. First and foremost, right, we mentioned our law students. Um, So one of our large goals is to teach law students how to become practicing attorneys in these areas, right? We also take a lot of what we're learning on the ground with our clients and we turn that information, we generalize it, and we turn it into things like the Fair Use app or some of the other written guides and resources on our website. We also have a YouTube channel, right, where we talk about some of these kind of basic concepts like copyright and trademark. We have we have a book as well that's it's called Don't Panic, a legal guide in plain English. A lot of our educational resources that you can find all of them on our website, newmediarights.org. They're all designed to make sure that we're being a source of reliable and accurate information. In the event that you need help, too, you can always reach out in our contact form. And and also related to that, too, is the I think the third big component of what we do here is um, some public policy advocacy. Mm -hmm. When the Copyright Office, when they put out studies and they're trying to figure out how well a certain section of the DMCA is or or is not working. Mm. Uh, we try to get involved in those proceedings when we have something to say. And I, I've, I've been a part of that. I think mm. uh, we... That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Jonathan, you've testified there in front of the Copyright Office at UCLA's mock courtroom. <laughs> And that goes back to 2009. And, and you know, we and, and also other groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the uh, UC Irvine Clinic, uh, you know, there's been a number of organizations that have worked for a long time, us going back to 2009, to make sure that documentary filmmakers, online video creators have the right to make fair use. Because uh, actually, there's a whole nother layer to the DMCA, totally different section that makes it illegal for you to break encryption <laughs> to access right. copyrighted works. And right. you, we want exceptions for those. And we fought for those on a number of fronts. But we were involved in a lot of other efforts, um, some successful, some not, some some not, and then successful, and then not again, like, <laughs> net neutrality, right? Um, right? Fought for a while for that. We'll see. Maybe they'll. Maybe that'll come back. So yeah, we work on the policy front as well. Is there is there anything else that you all wanted to that we didn't bring up that you would like to to say? Well, I mean, I guess I would just say if somebody's really, I know you know, like Erica said, obviously people are very interested in just just generally spending their time learning about copyright law. And so, but if, you know, for those, uh, for that right. person, <laughs> uh, for that person, they can actually keep their eyes open because for this, um, the Warhol lawsuit that, right, that's right. at the Supreme Court. Right. It's this case that has to do with a Prince photograph um, and the Andy Warhol Foundation. Oh. And it's sort of gone before the Supreme Court now. And I think they've heard their 
their initial arguments on For it. For once, I'm not sure that actually Prince himself is. I believe it's the photographer um, okay, who's yeah, on the yeah. other end of that. Not to, I know, but of course, Prince finds his way. I don't. What is I it? Know. Prince just Always finds there. his way into these copyright lawsuits, even if he's yeah. not the. Yeah, that's because th- this is about an image of Prince, <laughs> right? Image of Prince, yeah. and and so uh, the Supreme Court is is hearing this case. It is a complicated case. I mean, it's just, yeah. but it, the point I was bringing up is that when the court decides it, it actually could affect this whole discussion of transformation and what transformation is because the Second Circuit said some things in their decision. And essentially, you know, they said something to the effect of, you know, we really shouldn't be as a court. Uh, really getting too focused on the subjective intent of the artist and things like that. And I think that that's where a lot of folks get a little bit, you know, wonder where the court's going to go with this, because if they follow the, what the second circuit said, it seems to undermine some of the law in the space of transformation that, that really took shape after the Roy Orbison case, the Campbell versus a cup of Rose case with uh, the pretty woman song that was parodied. And so you know, I don't, if Andy Warhol can't get fair use or transformation, it'll be really interesting to see where sort of transformation goes. I don't think that Warhol should get some pass just because he's a very uh, famous artist, but I have to say it's going to really rock the boat in terms of fair use and what can be reused. Mm. What I think is interesting about the case too, is that there's all this like permission element, just a little bit in terms of the facts, as far as I know them, Goldsmith licensed to Vanity Fair, the images for an artistic rendering. And I believe it was basically for like one photo. Vanity Fair passed these photos over, you know, to Warhol and then Warhol kind of did what he felt like doing with them. And I believe it did run in Vanity Fair back in the 80s. But uh, Warhol apparently decided to do like, I forget what, 10 or 15 other, or yeah, yeah. <laughs> other prints uh, where he took the Prince photo and did his kind of, you know, typical sort of stylistic, you know, layering and, and kind of um, he flattened the images and added colors and different different things to it. And, you know, he, I think some courts might be a little hung up on, oh, well, he kind of, you know, he kind of obtained those photos in a little bit of a funny way, like originally sort of under permission, but then went beyond the bounds of, you know, and, and permission hasn't been a huge part of those cases, but I feel like it's operating in the background on what the, how the court is deciding here. The main point being, though, that it, it really might adjust the calculus when it comes to transformation. And so that's one to keep a very close eye on as we go forward. There's so many layers to that because, you know, culture builds on other culture and art builds on other art. And if it gets all gets thrown into question, I mean, that seems like it could open a floodgate. Right. The, the other thing that I was just going to mention offhand here is that, uh, you know, YouTube used to use my Donald Duck Glenn Beck video on their fair use page. Right. And I, I hadn't, hadn't looked in years. And so I wanted to see, is it still there? And so they've redone their whole page. But there is still a link there that says, see examples of fair use. And that's Google's link. The one example that's here <laughs> is my video. And so they have, you know, example of fair use. And there's there's right wing radio duck right there. <laughs> and then if you scroll down, actually, they have, um, you know, reinstated videos. And they've got Buffy versus Edward on there, too, linked over, oh. which I, you know, I, I had not seen it until today when I when I double checked it. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, I think your videos are some of the only YouTube videos I've ever seen cited in the informal copyright office right. proceedings <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> as well. So. So yeah, I guess maybe they carry a little more <laughs> weight with you too. And, and and yet I get dinged for copyright <laughs> every right. time. Right. But I, I don't want a special exception. I just uh, want we I are, just yeah. want them to consider fair use before they send that little plain thing. That's all. That would be nice. Well thank thank you both again for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jonathan, for having us. But I hope you enjoyed that discussion about fair use doctrine and your rights as a creator. Please remember that all Pop Culture Detective projects are 100% funded by listeners and viewers like you. So if you like this kind of in-depth media analysis, please consider going over to Patreon to support our work. Just go to patreon.com slash popdetective. 
As always, you can keep up to date with all of our projects on Twitter, at Pop Detective, and find all of our long-form video essays on the Pop Culture Detective YouTube channel. We'll be back again very soon with another audio file investigation. But until then, please remember to follow and subscribe wherever you happen to get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening.